Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MMA Island Podcast. We have a huge week of fights for you, McGregor Fight Week. I am Jack Kennedy, alongside the great Mace Martinez, and today we are joined by a fellow MMA Island journalist, Keelan McNamara. Keelan, thank you so much for joining us today. Not at all, guys. Absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Jack Kennedy, and they hit a lot harder, in my opinion, too. Mace Martinez. He put Aldo stiff in 13 seconds before Bruce Buffer could even plant his ass in his seat. I'm Marcos Diaz. You can't keep getting opportunities if you get hurt. And this is the MMA Island Podcast. Of course, yeah. Let's let's get right into it. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, obviously, we just had fights on the last fight uh, night, and it was a great some great fights. We'll be talking about our predictions, what we gave in our last podcast, and of course, Keelan will be weighing on, uh, weighing in on what he thought as well. Um, a lot of news to talk about, of course. Uh, and last, we'll be ending off with a Connor quote to guy kind of get you hyped up for um, this week in fights. So, let's go ahead and get into it. The co-main event of this past fight night was Carlos Condit versus Matt Brown. The two legends put on a fantastic fight. Um, what are you guys thinking on this one? Yeah, I thought it was a great fight. I, I had to go into decision, but I had predicted Brown would get it done. I, I thought that Brown took round one for sure. Uh, and, and first of all, the judges scored this fight 30 to 27 is on crack. That's just <laughs> crazy how they could make that, they could get that score from it. Uh, Condit fought very well in the second round. I thought he took that round easily. And I thought at the end of the third round with, with Brown ending on top, I thought that would give him the decision, uh, give him the nod. But, you know, obviously it didn't. But uh, credit to both of them. They both fought great. And, and Condit deserved the win. Now, it's a waiting game, really, for both of these guys. Uh, I know when we talked last, Jack, I told you I didn't know how many fights Condit had left on the, on the contract. Well, it turns out that was his last one. So, oh yeah, big time win for him. Uh, and, you know, we'll see where both him and Matt Brown go from there. I fully agree with Mace. Um, absolutely amazing fight. Five years in the making, I believe. Two true legends of the welterweight division. You know, Carlos Condit's a dog. We all know how good he is. His resume speaks for itself. His wars with Robbie Lawler and so on and so forth. The immortal Matt Brown, literally the nickname says everything. Um, I had Matt Brown win in the first round, most definitely. Condit looked really good coming back to win the second. Definitely had a toss-up even going into the third. Thought Condit deserved the decision, but both guys were a credit to themselves when I put everything on the line and, you know, just did themselves really good justice. Um, if that is Condit's last fight, obviously I hope it isn't. He looked absolutely fantastic. It was a real it was a real nice throwback to the old Carlos Condit that we all know and love. So yeah, really, really good co main event. Yeah, it was it was so good. These are two legends, obviously, in, in the UFC. So you kind of knew they were going to put on a great fight. I thought the fight was really going to take place on the feet with uh, two stand-up legends, especially at welterweight. But I was equally as entertained whenever it went to the ground, the grappling exchanges and everything. It was so exciting to watch. Um, and they really put it all on the line. And I don't know. I, so I, I thought Carlos Condit had the decision. It definitely wasn't 30-27. Matt Brown, I don't know how they scored that round against him because he pretty much dominated the whole round. He was on on top of Carlos Condit for the majority of it. Um, the second round I gave to Carlos Condit. And the third round, though it was closer, I still give it to Carlos Condit because even though Matt Brown ended up on top, I think Carlos Condit kind of controlled the fight up to that point. So I agree with the decision. Um, overall, just a fantastic fight between two absolute legends, and it was so great to see. Absolutely. Most definitely. All right, so the main event, I thought that was going to be the fight of the night, the co-main event, but then we get to the main event, and Max Holloway versus Calvin Cater, blown away. What are you guys thinking on this one? Uh, incredible performance by Max. He, he's never looked better, in my opinion. Uh, I've said it before, Jack, and I'll say it again. He, he's the best 145er on, on the planet. Oh, yeah. Uh, he should have the strap, in my opinion. I've said that, too. Uh, after Saturday night, you know, there's there's no doubt in my mind that he'll get the strap back uh, if he gets this shot. Um as far as being the best boxer in the UFC, I don't know about that. I think Connor is, in my opinion. And I think Connor feels that way, too, with the little response he put out uh, in regards to that statement. Yeah. As far as Cater goes, man, the toughness that he displayed throughout the fight was incredible. Um, maybe a little too tough for his own good at, at a certain point. 
uh, he was just getting pieced up, man, like nobody's business. Uh, able to land some big shots here and there, but Max was never in, really in any danger at, at all whatsoever throughout the fight. Um, tremendous performance. Holloway needs a next shot at the title. Oh, yeah. And Ortega, for sure. Yeah, um, I mean, what can you say about this fight that hasn't already been said in the media? What a firecracker of a main event open 2021. Um, coming into this fight, I knew it would be you know, a, an absolute barn burner. Calvin Cater, New England cartel, we know how tough this guy is. You know, did himself credit, even though it was a lopsided decision. Went in, never gave up, always looked for an opening. And, you know, really did himself credit. And his stock only goes up, even though he lost. You know, losing, as Mace correctly says, to the best 145 on the planet is no disgrace in that whatsoever, especially putting in a performance like that. But God damn, what a performance from Max Holloway. This is after the Volkanovsky fight. One would forgive Holloway for being a little bit disheartened, perhaps coming in being a bit flat in his next couple of fights. What a statement to make and what a way to bounce back. I think this is the best Max Holloway we have ever seen. And I think this is the best we've ever seen by a country mile. And I include the Ortega performance in that. This is another level of the Blessed Express. Um, as me says, absolutely, there's no question whatsoever. Next in line for the shot, the 145 strap, regardless of who wins between Ortega and Volkanovsky, Max is right in there. And I saw, I saw someone say online, it might have been on an MMA Island post, if Max is what we consider the gatekeeping standard of 145, then everybody better buckle in because Max looks like he could clean out everyone at this point. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That was a motivated Max Holloway we saw there. And I completely agree with you. I think that was the best we've ever seen him, which is crazy to think about with all the other fights. He put on an absolute clinic against a guy who I thought has, I think still has the most knockout power in that entire division. And he didn't even let him get close. It was insane. I, I, I Max Holloway not only said, okay, I should be getting the next title fight. He said, I am the champion of this division. Really, the belt is mine. Like, it, he just completely proved that he's the best featherweight in the division currently, and in my opinion of all time with that, with that performance. I completely, I'm blown away by his age every single time. He's only 29 years old. He's going to make another run. I think he beat Volkanovski the second time. It, it, it's crazy. He went out there and just completely picked apart one of the guys who has had the most momentum in that division in a little while didn't even give him a, even close to thinking about a round. There were three 10 eights there. That was the, the craziest thing I've ever seen. The most lopsided decision I've ever seen. I was really, after watching that, I couldn't stop watching. I watched every single post fight thing, everything. I was blown away. I have never seen such a dominant performance in a UFC fight in a main event. And what on paper should have been at least a competitive fight. It was unbelievable. I don't think Calvin Cater is a terrible fighter. In fact, I think he'll make a run for a title eventually. He's still got a lot of time to do it. It's just Max Holloway is on a level where I don't think anyone else in that division is anywhere close to. The amount of output that he put out there, setting all the records for every single strike, uh, striking thing, uh, is just incredible. And he's doing it through all five rounds. He didn't take a he didn't take a step backwards the entire time. It was insane. I, I, no one else could do that. I was completely blown away. I think maybe Calvin Cater's he's going to keep fighting. He's a very tough fighter. I think maybe this corner should have thrown the towel in at the end of the fourth round where he was just literally standing there getting elbowed over and over again. Um, overall, though, I mean, what else can you say except for the best is still blessed and Max Holloway is 100% next in line for the title. Agreed. Absolutely no question whatsoever. I mean, um, I know me and you've talked about it a bit, Jack, and I think I've mentioned it to Mace also. I was watching that fight and I was getting Shades Vets and Barbosa down hooker. Like, just stop the fight already. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's how goddamn good this guy is. And that's such an incredible thing to say because Calvin Kidd is a top five favorite. Oh, yeah. Like, this guy, we know how good he is. And Max made it look effortless. It truly was float like a butterfly sting, like a bee stuff. Yeah. He went in there and, and he, uh, I actually think it's the least damage I've ever seen Holloway take in a fight. 
like it's, it just defies all UFC logic. But, you know, the Blast Express just keeps thundering through 145. And as you guys have both said, absolutely next title shot, unquestionably. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, continuing with that into our first piece of news, um, two massive fights have been booked in the UFC. They are official. Stipe Miocic versus Nganu. Two has been booked as the main event. And relating back to the fight we just talked about, Volkanovski versus a very improved um, Brian Ortega has been booked for the co-main event. Big card there. What are you guys thinking about these uh, fights being booked? Yeah, so I, th- I think it's scheduled for March. It should be a great fight. Um, Ortega's made some massive changes since the first Holloway, uh, since the Holloway fight, the beatdown that, that was similar to the beatdown Cater just got this past weekend. Uh, so while those improve with those improvements, Ortega should Ortega shouldn't have an issue standing with Volkanovski, in my opinion. Uh, obviously, his jiu-jitsu game is world class and it, it could counter uh, to Volk's wrestling. Uh, if he does get taken down, I don't think that'd be smart of Volkanovski to go to the ground with him. I think he's going to have to try to win this fight on the feet. Um, in my opinion, Volkanovski's reign as champion is, is over. It's about over. Uh, I think Ortega wins by submission, and then boom, we get Max Holloway and Ortega part two, and and everything at 145 will be right again after that one. Yeah, I think it's just it's such an interesting dynamic for the 145 strap right now. This Volkanovski or Tega title fight is going to be absolutely ridiculous. Um, I think Mace is absolutely correct. Volkanovski's best bet, I think, is actually keeping this on the feet as opposed to using his world class wrestling against Holloway on the ground. Um, and again, I actually come at this with a very similar prediction. I think Ortega's boxing development has just gone up three or four good levels since the Holloway fight. And, you know, perhaps it's done in the absolute world of good. Sometimes one needs such a big loss in order to see where you really need to improve. And, you know, his Brazilian jiu-jitsu game, it speaks for itself, the record's there. I think, I think Ortega tires out Volkanovski, perhaps in the fourth or fifth round. I think Volkanovski goes in for somewhat of a tired takedown. Ortega pulls guard, and I do think it's over from there. Ortega's an absolute anaconda on the ground. And I can also very much see Volkanovski's title reign being in the sort of twilight of his reign already. And then the dynamic that sets for Ortega Holloway, you know, it writes itself. It's so interesting, but a smashing title fight, no question about it. I am so excited for 145. It is awesome. Ortega has looked so good. I didn't think he was going to stand a chance against the Korean zombie, especially taking that much time off. But what I was completely wrong about is he used that time to completely revamp his stand-up game. He is a completely different fighter than what he used to be. He outstruck and really outperformed the, the Korean zombie, who is one of the best strikers in 145 and, and the whole UFC. It was shocking to see. Um, Volkanovski, I don't think, has that elite of a stand-up game. The way, the, the way uh, Ortega just fought, I think he's better than or uh, Volkanovski on the feet. The way he just fought, and he's taller, has more range. Um, Volkanovski, if he if that if he gets if it gets to that point, he's going to want to take him down. He, it, it, I don't think he'll be able to take him down though because of the submission game. That's Ortega's whole ballpark. That's where he wants to, any fight to go. It's such an interesting matchup, and just anywhere you put it, it just it looks like it favors Ortega in that. So I'm leaning in the exact same direction. So that's that's my early prediction for that one, and then just oh. Biggest featherweight possibly of all time fight of all time right there. Ortega 2.0 versus the Max Holloway that we just saw, who just completely picked apart one of the best contenders in the division. Oh, man, I cannot wait for that. Um, Pending Ortega gets through Volkanovski. So I am so excited. Also, that would pose no questions to giving Holloway the title shot because then you can't even say, oh, Volkanovski's already beat him twice. Why would you match him a third time? Takes that out of the equation. I am so excited for the featherweight division. I'm blown away by Max Holloway, and this just looks so exciting to me. And plus, I mean, Stipe and Gagne, too, it's the main event. I mean, it, the card doesn't get much better than that. Right. And in uh, a fight between Max and, and Ortega, obviously, I think I'd, I'd give Max the, the, the nod in that one. But we'll really be able to see the improvements that Ortega made after the first Holloway fight if they go again. Uh, has he improved enough to beat Holloway? Not the Holloway we just saw on Saturday. He oh, has yes. not improved that much. That's that's without a doubt, but 
uh, a much better showing he'd be able to put forward uh, compared to the first go round. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Mace has just hit the nail on the head there. I think that story very much writes itself. I think perhaps in the next six months, pending the result that we think will happen, I think you see a Holloway Ortega super fight. Holloway Ortega two for the title, much much improved Ortega on the feet. You know, the most dominant Holloway we've ever seen. Again, I still think Holloway wins that. It's definitely a far, far better showing from T-City. Uh, but I still think Holloway wins that. I think it, the boxing and the stand-up we've seen is just levels from anything I've really seen, seen since Connor's run at 145 five years ago. Ortega's, or sorry, Holloway's almost picked up that mantle. And it's, it's just so amazing to see. And then... Briefly segueing on to the heavyweight division, what a title fight. Oh, yeah. You know, Francis Ngannou, you know, what a knockout against Jairzinho Rossenstreich. Uh, Stipe Miocic is the baddest man on the planet. I think he's the best heavyweight of all time at this point based on, you know, just the defenses and the nature of those defenses. Personally, I still give that fight to Stipe. Um, if one, if I was to be critical of Ngannou, his knockout against Ross and Stroik I thought was quite messy almost. His strikes were quite wild and he did hit him with a like a free train to the left uppercut. Um, but, you know, he was quite lucky in where he landed it. I think Ross and Stroik, he wasn't great at getting out of the way. Stipe's not going to be there for that punch to land. Stipe's going to be out of the way. The fight will be on the ground. And the question really is, has Ngani's wrestling developed? to such a level that he can get this fight back up again. And on the basis of how utterly dominant the first fight was, I have to go with Stipe. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, I agree with that. I think it's such an interesting matchup because you'll really get to see how much Ngannou has improved, just like you said. So uh, I, I can't wait. I can't wait. Yeah, he nailed it right there. I love that fight. I don't see it going any differently than the first one. I think Miocic's main concern is, is being knocked out early. Uh, if he can withstand the first round or two without getting caught, then I think uh, I think he can finish Francis later on or, or cruise to a decision. Uh, like Keelan said, I'm interested to see the, the improvements in Ngannou's wrestling. And if there's been any whatsoever, I think that's the only way he makes this uh, a fight. It's it definitely going to be competitive, but I, I just give Miocic the nod uh, over him. Obviously, he's beaten him once. Um, but I think I think some wrestling mixed in there with Ngannou can open up a, an opportunity for some shots to land, but uh, like Keelan said, Stipe is the greatest of all time, greatest heavyweight of all time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I expect him to yeah. prove that again. I think he gets it done. All right. Now, on to what was the biggest kind of announcement. They hyped it up a lot. The decision of MMA. Aviv Nurmagomedov, uh, it wasn't very much of a decision. <laughs> he <laughs> says if someone will impress him, he will come back. What do you guys think that really means? Well, in my opinion, the meeting was pointless. <laughs> if we knew that that's the answer he was coming with, then he should have met with Dana after the pay-per-view on Saturday. You know, what, what was all this drama about is my question. Like, Dana making it seem like he's going to drop some earth-shattering announcement and doing the media comparing it to, like, the LeBron James announcement, like, I'm going to South Beach announcement. Yeah. And then we're here like, uh, I'm not deciding until after the fight on Saturday. So the meeting was a complete waste of time. But it was a nice job by Dana White to to make sure that everybody to keep everybody waiting and and not making the announcement until he knew they were tuned into the to the fight night on Saturday. So uh, good job for him on that. But that that was just that was just a waste of time, waste of everything. Yeah, I mean Mason's absolutely right. Um, Dana is kind of like the ultimate showman of combat sports, in my opinion. It was very very clever the way he dragged it out you know not even alluding to it, but creating the comparisons with LeBron James joining the heat and then you know ultimately the meeting was what we knew it was going to be anyway Khabib's kind of one foot in one foot out what do I see happening with McGregor Poirier is there anything interesting for him left but I do actually think there's a really interesting angle here if I may and I don't think that many people have picked up on it my opinion is this just from looking at what's happened I think what Dane is trying to do is Dane has realized Khabib, Khabib, Khabib's a very sincere guy. And I don't think you can ever write 10 or 12 zeros on the end of a check to get him back in. If he's out, he's out. 
But I do believe that if there's something that can stir his fighting ego enough, then he will get him back in. And I think that's what Dane is actually looking for. I think we all know that he wants to strap back on Connor as soon as. And I think what Dane is hoping subconsciously is Khabib sees McGregor with Khabib's championship. And I think he's hoping that riles Khabib enough that he comes back one last time for McGregor, Khabib too. And I think that's the angle he's actually approaching it from. He's trying to stir the warrior within as opposed to using the dollar to lure him back. And perhaps it might be a very clever move in Dana's part that none of us ever realized. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting uh, take on it. I'm going to go a different direction, though. Um, I think that it's very interesting what is going on with this. And overall, it was just a huge – it was a great job by Dana White to hype this whole thing up because it got everyone looking at it, um, and and especially the car on ABC. It got everyone tuning in. Um, For me, though – what it sounds like is a V went in there and kind of said, I'm not really looking for a fight right now. And Dana White kept going on and on and on. And for me, he was just kind of like, okay, I'll see who impresses me. And then we'll see what happens. That's kind of how I saw it. And then Dana White, of course, can say, oh, he's like, okay, let's see what's going on. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Because he seems like he's a very sincere guy. And what he said about his mother, I think he is actually meaning that. Um, would I like to see him again? Of course, I'd like to see him again. Everyone wants to see a view again. But I don't really know if he really is going to come back. Uh, obviously, we'll see that uh, very soon. But I mean, what 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 does impress him mean or anything? I guess we'll I guess we'll find out, or maybe we'll just never get an answer, and it will always be a rumor, which is kind of like GSP right now. I think that might be another possibility. It's never really official that he's retired, but he, he you know that it might it might be that. So that's that's kind of my whole takeaway from it. Yeah, I, right. I agree. All right, so last little piece of this podcast. Conor McGregor obviously fighting on uh, Saturday. He is getting a lot of interviews, and he said a very interesting thing. He said he would finish Dustin Poirier in 60 seconds. Um, what do you guys think about this one? Uh, I've, I've never doubted McGregor, especially his predictions. Uh, you know, maybe the Mayweather prediction, but that's it. Um, he predicted the, the first Poirier fight. He, fi- he predicted the finish in that one. And he predicted the Aldo KO, you know, down to the actual exchange of punches. Um, so oh, if he yeah. stays inside 60 seconds, then I believe uh, he'll come out looking for the KO within that first minute. Uh, the question then becomes, you know, can Poirier withstand that first minute? And, and or can he avoid the heavy, you know, exchange, you know, at all? Can he avoid it? Um, more than anything, I love the confidence of McGregor and for Dustin, even if he is knocked out in that first minute, which, uh, uh, I'm not too sure about that, but I believe he will be knocked out eventually. Uh, you know, Dustin and the good fight foundation, they win, uh, oh, yeah. which is incredible. You know, Dustin's going to make a shitload of money on Saturday and, you know, his foundation is going to get paid, I think half a million dollars from Connor. So regardless of the outcome of the fight, which will be a McGregor finish, in my opinion. Uh, Poirier wins on Saturday night. And, you know, that this is what the sport's all about. I, I just can't wait to see it all unfold. Yeah, I think Mace makes a fantastic point, actually, especially about Dustin's foundation. You know, he's doing an unbelievable thing for his people. And more than anything, he's to be commended as a human being. You know, he's so devoted to Louisiana and to his people and, you know, it, it's a sign of the true class of Dustin that we always knew he was anyway. In terms of the fight, you know, McGregor's the ultimate self-promoter and the self-hype man. No one does it better. I doubt anybody ever will do it better whenever Conor McGregor's eventually a myth and a legacy. Um, in terms of the 60 seconds, what Conor does so cleverly is he never makes a prediction that he doesn't back up. Throughout his fighting career, he's always left us just enough sort of of a trail of crumbs to justify the fact that he might actually be right. But then he says to Ariel Hawani that he wants a war also. Yeah. So what he's doing, he's playing the two sides of the fight spectrum very, very cleverly. He wants a war, yet he predicts an early finish. So, you know, Connor's just so smart at that. Um, I really don't think anybody can say any different. In terms of the fight itself, how I see it going, 
Um, I actually did an article about this for a website. Everybody, please do feel free to check that out also. Yep. And check out, obviously, Mason Jack's work on that too. Um, in terms of the fight itself, the X factor of this fight, the McGregor left hand, it's just a laser guy to bomb that always finds its target. Um, you know, I love Justin. I think he's come on level since 2014, obviously. He's been a title holder. He's gone through the toughest of the tough that the division has to offer, including Khabib himself with a very, very solid showing. But I think within the first round, McGregor lands a decent left hand. I do think, unfortunately, it wobbles Dustin, and then it is just a matter of time for when it lands again and Dustin's out. Interestingly, though, I do have a soft spot for Dustin, and I kind of want to see him win this draft before he eventually retires, because I think he's just been through so much that, you know, just on a heartwarming level, he deserves it. But in terms of the promotion and in terms of what's valuable, I think McGregor wins this. I just think he's too good. I think his boxing's too good. I think his stand-up's too good. The only way I see Dustin winning this is using his cardio and dragging this into the later rounds. But then I don't. I just don't think he survives that long. I think that might actually be his plan. I think he's going to try and counter box with McGregor and try and drag this into the third, fourth, fifth rounds when McGregor does generally gas out. But, you know, if motivating McGregor's ever been anything to go by, I think he just does too much for Dustin on the night. McGregor KO within two rounds. Yeah, I like that. Um, I, I don't know about – I think he truly believes this with most things Connor says. I, he is 100% I think he believes this. I don't know if it will happen. Uh, again, I think uh, – Keelan, you, you guys pretty much said it, so I'm not going to talk that much. But you guys pretty much said it. I think Dustin Poirier is ready to go. I think he can take a heavier shot. Um. So I don't think he'll get finished in 60 seconds, but I know Connor believes it, and I know he'll go out there and try and back it up. So I'm so excited for this fight. And quotes like this, quotes like the war quote, gets me so excited. Gets me so excited. And if Connor does pull it off inside 60 seconds, he, he I mean, he's already a megastar, but what can you say about him after that? Yeah. If something like that against a guy like Poirier, that'd be incredible. I mean, if something like that happens, then, you know, not only is Conor McGregor back, but he shoots off into the stratosphere again. And if anything, he goes further than that, doing it against such a high-level guy like Poirier. And, you know, if he does do that and he ends in such dramatic and emphatic fashion, then the rest of 155 really does need to watch their back. Yeah, 100%. Um yeah, I completely agree. I think that'll do it for this podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, make sure to go check out Keelan's work on our website, MMAisland.net. And of course, follow us on Instagram at MMA Island. Um, thank you guys again so much for listening. And thanks for coming on, Keelan. Not at all, Jack. Mace, thank you guys so much for having me. Hopefully we can do this a hell of a lot more. I've loved it. I've lo- I, lo- I love giving my opinion anyway. So hopefully we can make this a thing. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, appreciate it, guys.